Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jamie Machik, Education Consultant for the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. And thank you so much for joining us, whether you're at your library today or maybe you're working from home because your library is closed today due to the, due to the weather. This presentation is called What I Wish I Had Known, Reflections of a Public Library Director with Teresa Minette of the Dear Moon Memorial Library in Stanley, Wisconsin. This is a 30 minute presentation today, a little shorter than our usual 60 minutes, and we, shall, we still should have some time for questions at the end. So Teresa, whenever you're ready, please begin. All right, hi everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, so this presentation was inspired by a session I attended at WLA 2018 called, What I Wish I Had Known Then, Lessons Learned as Managers and Leaders, which was a panel of library managers speaking about leadership in libraries and their experiences. Uh, for my presentation today, I squiggled out the public and library director since I have experience working in a pretty diverse group of libraries. Um, and I'm hoping that what I share today will be useful for all library managers, um, although the main focus will be on public libraries, so that's most of my experience. All right, so one of the major points in the presentation I attended was that change happens in libraries. Um, the most basic time I think we've constantly run up against this as library directors um, is this idea that libraries are only places for books, which as we know is just not the case anymore. Uh, the longer I work in the business and the more I remember from library school, the more I tend, um, the more I tend to call libraries community spaces with collections. Um, so the collections certainly have books, audiobooks, DVDs, and music, but they can also have uh, special collections as well, or archives. Um, but the changes we face aren't just with collections, they're with staff, budget, space, policies, patrons, and you yourself, just to name a few. Um, so literally everything around you changes, so uh, you have to be flexible enough to change as well. Um, I think we also know that when change occurs, very little goes according to plan. <laughs> uh, so we have to learn to go with the flow without allowing the odd places we end up in get to us. So servant leadership is also really stressed. Uh, we directors are here for our patrons to efficiently use their tax dollars. Uh, we're also here for our staff. Uh, leadership takes many forms. That being said, while you're a figurehead, you can't do everything. You don't have to be the face of everything that goes on in the library. Uh, delegating to talented, experienced staff is great since you totally do it. <laughs> I remember being told once in regards to programming that some librarians try to do and learn everything instead of calling in experts from the community. You don't have to learn oil painting if you have a staff member or a volunteer come in and do it. Uh, so a servant leader won't pressure themselves to do these things. Uh, they would know it's best for them and for their community if they don't. So staff leadership goes along with this. Uh, to promote leadership in your staff, uh, try to heal past wounds and give them opportunities. Um, in my experience, a lot of the wounds I've had to work on with staff have been for management in the past. Um, it's good to move forward by putting staff on a project or a team where they will be successful. If you can create a win, create a win. When you do this, you win, your patrons win, and staff is more confident. Um, so set them up for success. That being said, eventually allowing for small failures is important too. Uh, it's just realistic. Um, but this is nice to control if you can. Um, so having staff play to their strengths is good. Uh, as a new director, I found this to be incredibly helpful when you're in training and you need the extra support. So some examples of where I've promoted staff leadership are in programming, uh, community connections, and work in local history. So programming, uh, again, you don't need to learn oil painting if someone on your staff already knows how. <laughs> so right now, my program assistant is really artsy and taking on the monster load of the programming that we're doing at the DR Moon Library. Uh, she enjoys doing this and is really good at it, and it's just been the most tremendous help to me. Uh, as I've been transitioning to a new position these last two months. Um, so community connections, I've moved a lot over the last couple of years and therefore had to switch jobs. Um, so it's important for me to know who on my staff and on my board 
um, live in community, have lived in the community for years. And um, who knows people in the community who'd be willing to help the library. Um, this is especially important, I think, when we're talking about the tight-knit rural communities in Wisconsin. Uh, so local history. Uh, I found that a lot of local history is fairly recent, depending on your perspective. And sometimes there are older folks on your staff or even patrons who remember when events actually took place. Um, so staff who are from the community are typically invested in it and have grown up hearing about it. So they've, uh, they're a really great resource for someone like myself who isn't from the area. I encourage responsibility among your staff. Uh, when I was home at Christmas time, my little nephew has Charlie Brown's Christmas completely memorized. So he spent the whole week asking us, are you afraid of responsibility? Uh, so words to ponder. Um, you need to hold your staff accountable. Um, root out who's responsible when something goes wrong. It's not always the person left holding the stick. Um, if you are the one who's culpable, accept the responsibility when something goes wrong. Um, set the right example. I think this really helps the situation to calm down a lot quicker than playing the blame game with innocent staff. Uh, when you found out that you what you need to about the situation, be empathetic, but also know if someone is not going to be successful. A standard has to be kept, and you have to make the hard decisions sometimes. Um, it's also a good practice to document conversations and save emails for your own reference, uh, if not for later use. This may not be very comfortable for you, but it's part of being a good, responsible, and fair manager. Okay, organize. Um, I would say that this uh, should be intuitive to most librarians. Uh, tends to be what I brag about during interviews. Uh, we tend to have that sort of personality. Um, there are so many things to do or choose. As I like to say, you can get bogged down or forget tasks that you don't do very often. Uh, so figure out a method of organization and then do that. Um, that isn't necessarily the same for everyone. It just doesn't always look the same depending on the individual. Um, so do what works for you. My concern is always uh, if I don't stay organized, then some actually important things can fall through the cracks. Uh, for example, I have more bills to pay for my current institution than I did at my previous place of employment. So I use an accounting program now instead of just Word. Um, this is me being organized and responsible to the best of my ability. And the pictures, um, a friend of mine just uh, recently posted this on social media. It's Albert Einstein's desk the day he died. Uh, so know that your work won't always be picture perfect, and that's okay. Uh, it seemed to work out for him. So I included some examples of yearly tasks since those are the most difficult for me to keep track of. Uh, the examples I chose are cross-county funding and the annual report. I super recommend having a director binder uh, with lists of daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly tasks and tips on how to do these things, like um, on how to do these tasks, like passwords, websites, lists of favorite authors, lists of vendors, contact information for people who can help you. Uh, just in general, it could be another librarian, system staff, um, vendors, phone number, email, whatever. Um, you should check your binder every few weeks and do what it says. This will help you not to miss those yearly deadlines. Uh, while you can eventually get used to this as a new director, uh, especially for me, those yearly tasks are really difficult. Um, so your system should help you with these things, but you should also be responsible enough to have collected something like the county clerk's address in advance. Um, but be open to collaboration. Uh, listen to the concerns of local groups who collaborate with you. They're part of your team for that time, so try to work well with them. Part of collaboration is timing, so never schedule an event or a meeting during a Packers game or any other local events. So for sure, while a large part of that is wanting people to actually show up and knowing that attendance statistics would be poor, I think a more positive spin is trying to work with your community. Why should we compete in groups or with groups in the community that we are trying to support? Uh, so let your volunteers as well as your public enjoy these other local events. 
uh, as a public librarian, your municipality is everything. So work with them, listen to their needs, and know what they want. So I think this was the best piece of advice um, I got given from the mentor I was assigned through WBLS. Uh, this has to do with not getting overwhelmed or burnt out. So I personally need to make lists for so much of what I do or else I'll just forget. Um, so make a physical list of everything that you can think of that you need to do. Uh, just get it all out there. And then choose three items from the list to make priorities. I use this throughout the last year and it's made a huge impact on my professional life. So uh, when I was working at Whitney Public Library, I used to choose three things to work on for about a two week period. Um, that was a smaller grade three library. So now at Stanley at the DR Moon Library, I usually have to pick three things for the day. Um, that may be training as well, I don't know. Um, but they tend to be things like check that staff has turned in their availability, enter bills into QuickBooks and run lists on the ILS. Um, moving forward, I'm thinking of picking three things for the day, three things for about a month or between board meetings is also kind of a good time to uh, choose to do things, and three things for the year. Also, I think my director report at board meeting, um, or I think of it as basically a list of the priorities that I accomplished or I'm working on. Uh, also, if you have a strategic plan for your library, you could think of that as a list and you can pick three things from that as well. So whatever works for you, but just pick three. Uh, forgive yourself. Not every idea or program will work. And that's okay. Uh, for me, this mostly has to do with programming. Um, to me, other areas of failure just seem like bad luck or your board said no or you didn't have time. But planning a program that you think is great and then not having anyone come can take an emotional toll on you. So just try not to let this happen. Uh, do your best to avoid the problem <clears throat> or to do your best to avoid this problem. Um, they recommended at the conference that it's good practice to determine before programming, interest level, budget, space, and intended outcomes. Uh, keeping these things in mind before you put in a lot of effort can help you cover yourself, but if it still doesn't work out, know that that's okay and that you did your best and just forgive yourself. Use your space. The public needs to be able to find things. Um, they won't check it out if they can't find it. Uh, so they should see an organized, fun, clean space when they come into your library, even if it's a smaller one. Uh, you have, if you have more space or can expand the meeting rooms or a place for virtual reality, that's great as well. Awesome. Your staff needs to be happy. They need their space and probably a cubby for chocolate. <laughs> you need to be happy. Clutter's, clutter's normal in a library, but just try to keep it down. Um, reducing clutter is a great way of reducing stress in your professional and personal life. Uh, so I included a picture here of my desk as it is now, uh, which is tucked away behind that shelf of audiobooks. Uh, you can see it right before the window. Um, this setup will hopefully be changing soon as we are looking to rearrange how we have our public access computers set up. Uh, they're currently scattered all over the library and it's really confusing and not user friendly. Uh, so I wanna make a nice row of public access computers in the space where my desk currently is and move my desk to another room. I think our building is currently pretty user-friendly overall, um, but the computer situation is our greatest weakness in this area, I think, right now. Um, so I'm looking forward to fixing that. So displays. Um, in my experience in the business, patrons check out a book or a DVD uh, because of its cover. <laughs> I know, reading a book by its cover. Um, but items on display get checked out. Um, so when I was at Withy, I changed the new adult fiction display so that it was the first thing you see when you walk into the library, as you can see from the picture. Uh, I also displayed our donation of books from the Library of Cong Congress Surplus Books Program. Uh, this is a very large donation that we wanted to showcase, so we continually added them to our front display as they were checked out. In my new institution, we don't have as many specific display areas, but we use the tops of the shorter bookshelves. I uh, keep meaning to do one of those displays that says it has red on the cover and has a bunch of red covered books uh, in the display. 
So the internet has a lot of good ideas about displays if you're stuck. Um, so marking, this changes a bit depending on where you are and how many papers are in your area and what social media is popular in your area. I believe that using everything at your disposal, unless it's been proven, that one of the methods doesn't work. Um, so in marketing, I use social media. For me, that means Facebook, although we're currently thinking of getting an Instagram at my current institution, um, mostly pictures of programs. Uh, the local newspapers, flyers around town, the library website, and the school newsletter or library. Uh, in a tiny town, I like using every method of advertising at my disposal, since some folks don't have access to the internet. Uh, having a readable calendar on your website with all your current planned programming is also a great idea. Um, also, I found that the older folks read the paper and like listening uh, or hearing about what's going on in the community. Uh, in my experience, the younger people are best reached uh, by the school. Uh, when I was at Withy, I would email flyers to the school media specialist. Uh, getting into the school newsletter is also an option um, of getting to the parents specifically. Um, but timing was just never great for me at Wiki, so I didn't utilize this as much as I could have. Um, but if you can get into the habit of advertising there and your school is supportive of you, um, then definitely build that relationship. All right, grant writing. Um, this is something I think we all struggle to find the time to do, um, but it's a great resource. Um, especially if you have a specific project in mind. Uh, so remember that grant money is awarded for very specific reasons. And if you don't fit the foundation's qualifications, then do not apply. Um, yeah, follow the directions to the letter. If they say wrap it up in red ribbon, wrap it up in red ribbon. Um, they have some weird things they want you to do sometimes, but just be really, really specific. Um, the grants that I've written were in-kind donations, for books and prizes. Um, so I got a list of the things that I was awarded um, here and links to um, the applications. So uh, the Pilcrow Foundation uh, provides a two to one match to a rural public libraries that receive a grant through its children's book project. Uh, so you fundraise, um, then you send them a check. Um, I think it's between two and $400 and they match that contribution two to one and send you that dollar amount in books. Um, they have a lot of really nice new things. I was really happy with the books we got from them. Um, the Library of Congress Surplus Books Program, you send a representative to the Library of Congress to select books for you from their surplus. Uh, the books I received were largely from the last two years. Um, so they were really new, um, in really good condition. Um, but you need to know somebody going to the DC area um, shipping was also free since our state senator sent frank labels to the Library of Congress. And they'll tell you about that and they'll, they'll help you through that process. It's really easy. Um, donation from the Packers. Um, so at Withy, we had an annual fundraiser at the Village Fair where we needed prizes, um, just small little things. Um, so I filled out a form on the Packers website and they sent a bunch of like those drawstring backpacks, pencil cases, and little squishy footballs to use as prizes. Uh, so make sure you give them a lot of time though, because they are the Packers and they're super busy. Uh, was that we didn't keep our grant records all in the same place. Um, so that will change next year, <laughs> just so I don't have to waste time going through files, even if the files are organized. Um, still just having to go through a lot of files is just more than what you need to do during this stressful time. All right, so do the right thing. Uh, politics are part of what we do. Uh, we have many people to serve and can get caught up in so many different aspects of this job. Um, when you've done everything that you can do and just don't know what else can be done, just do what's right. Uh, <laughs> let your conscience be your guide, to quote Jimmy Cricket. All right, and finishing up, I read this quote in a novel some time back. It's from an English theologian and author in the 14th century. 
it reminds me that when you choose to do the right thing, you can have hope. And specifically, if you look at the big picture, the world won't end over most of the things that we deal with at work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it just helps, helps keep me grounded. All right, thank you everyone. Um, that's my contact information. Um, so feel free to call me or uh, email me with any questions or comments you have about this presentation. Um, and I'm willing and able to take questions now. So thank you. Great, thank you, Teresa. So I just lost internet uh, connectivity for about five minutes there, and I don't know. <laughs> so I wasn't <laughs> able to hear or see anything, and then all of a sudden it came back on. So I, Teresa, did you experience any disconnection? Nothing happened on your end? I didn't notice it. Okay. Um, so I hope that you were affected. So good, awesome. Okay, we did have a couple of questions come in, so we'll get right to that. Um, one of the questions is, was there a decision for your library not to be on Twitter? Can you expand upon the reasoning behind that decision? Oh, was there a specific reason? Um, no, I, I don't personally care for Twitter very much. Um, it's just like a very personal thing. Um, although so many people are on it, um, it should be something to think about. My staff is just very pro Instagram right now. So as far as the hierarchy of adding um, social media, we're looking to add an Instagram first and then maybe a Twitter after that. Uh, thank you. And just to um, also add to that, uh, we at WVLS closed our Twitter account earlier in the year uh, because it, it wasn't getting, I guess, the reach that we wanted. And I think when using social media tools, that's something that, you know, you have to decide as a director, like, is this worth the time or energy that I'm going to, to spend? And we chose instead to spend more of our time and energy on Facebook, where we have more of a following. Um, I don't know that I see a lot of libraries using Twitter as much, maybe maybe years ago, uh, but I, I'm curious, how many of you have a Twitter page for your library? Uh, type that in the question box if you don't mind. Um, I wouldn't mind finding that out. Another question is, what do you think most surprised you when you first became a new director? So did you think things were going to be a certain way and then did your mind completely change about something? <laughs> um, yes and no, I think. Um, I think we kind of all just hope that we're going to be, when you come out of library school, you're like, oh, I'm going to be doing reference and collections all my time, or that's just how I'm going to spend all my time. Um, and you kind of forget, especially as a director, that you're the face of your library, that you represent your library. Um, like I said, you don't have to be the face of everything. If there's a program, your staff is efficient at running, let them run it. It's great. Um, but yeah, just being in contact with so many people. Um, like I know the previous director of the ER Moon Library had connections with all sorts of counties, with the school board. Um, like I hadn't even thought of going to the school board. Um, but yeah, have that relationship. So yeah, make, make every relationship you can in your community, basically. Um, that wasn't, I think, stressed to me that much in library school. So that was a surprise and something that I'm trying to work on now. Great. And what, what other types of things do you think you're taking from your previous experience now to your to your new position? Or are you are you changing a lot of things? Um, mostly I've always had I've always worked um, for the government in some way, shape or form. And there's always a lot of rules. <laughs> so to me, like going over policies is just always really important and to like have those out there. Like if you don't have a social media policy, get a social media policy. Um, write one, email the other libraries in your system and ask them for theirs. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I just forgot the question. <laughs> um, what, what was it again? If, if, if things that you did in your, in your previous, previous director job, oh, you yeah. a lot of yeah. those things to this one. Yeah, so basic, basically, yeah, just, just keeping with policy um, has been a major one. Um, yeah. Another question, and this will probably be the, the last one if we're running close to out of time. When I think new people, when people are new to management or maybe library directorship, and maybe they're brand new that, to that community, 
one thing I see often as a, a library consultant is that they want to come in and and change a lot of things, change that they things that they see wrong or things that they'd like to do better. Mm -hmm. But I think that also has to be done with a little bit of sensitivity as well. So do you have any thoughts on, you know, how to do that? You know, like, so let's say there's a, a shelving unit that the library's had forever, but that everybody just seems to adore. You know, that, that's just a, a very, that's, that's an example. But how do you combat wanting to start these new ideas, but then being respectful of change, not only to your community, but also to your staff? Sure. Yeah, that's, um, I've come up against that a lot, I'm sure. A lot of us have um the advice i was given was wait a year just kind of don't really change anything for the first year or make small uh, changes okay um wait a year and then kind of slowly start doing it out then um and i think that's important too i mean not to discredit your ideas but also sometimes if things are done a certain way they were for a reason so waiting helps you to find out that reason and sometimes there is no reason <laughs> and you're like well that's inefficient and then you change it and it's better um so i do think um as much as we want to like change everything and make it great right away it's okay to wait just a little while and just to have patience um and to find out i mean like i just found out the other day that there's a gentleman who really wants one of the windows in my library open that's boarded right now oh. um I've been there two months and I just found this out, but there is someone from the community that just really wants this window. So <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's really little nitpicky things and sometimes it's big things. Sure. Um, so also, yeah, choose your battles. Um, definitely choose your battles. And if there's something really big um, that just needs to go, um, then wait and then present that to your board, uh, present that to your staff and just be like, you know, I think I think this is the problem with this. And don't you think it would be better? Um, right. And just just be gentle, be enthusiastic, right. be gentle. Yeah. And explaining why, like the process behind the why, I think is really important exactly. too. Um, I, I saw a few comments about Twitter. Uh, uh, Rachel says, we only have Facebook, may add Instagram due to teen input. Um, yes, I did hear recently at a, at a marketing conference that a lot of teens are leaving Snapchat and going to Instagram now. So a lot of libraries who had Snapchat accounts are, are closing those. And that's kind of the beauty of social media. You know, it's fluid. You know, it's always changing, and we can adapt to that. Um, Gerard said, Blake Mills has Twitter, but we do not post very often. Um, great. So thank you all for um, your comments and questions. Thank you, Teresa, for an excellent presentation. As I mentioned, the recording and our Teresa slides will be available later today on our conference, I'm sorry, on our organization's website. So with that said, I hope you all have a great rest of your day, a great rest of your week. And please uh, stay warm and safe out there. So long.